The following was a book discussion featuring author Bill Moore on his book Never Panic Early, an Apollo 13 astronaut's journey about lunar module pilot Fred Hayes. Well, Fred, I wanted to, I wanted to start off by asking you about uh, Norman, Oklahoma. When you were here in the late 1950s, I wonder if you might tell everyone what, uh, what Norman was like in, in the University of Oklahoma. Well, it, it actually, at that time, uh, and this was 1956 through the spring of 59, uh, it was pretty small. Uh, I had a bicycle, uh, for instance, that, uh, living at North Campus, Westheimer Field. Uh, I could use my bicycle to go uh, to school every day down to university, and it was much handier to get around the campus uh, rather than having to worry about a car and parking the car. And uh, the uh, the whole the whole city was uh, what I call it a small city. Uh, the university itself uh, predominated because its uh, population. I think the population at the time was over five thousand, uh, but less than six thousand. And so you can see it's grown quite a bit uh, over the years. So it was much uh, student population uh, in those days. Uh, but like I said, uh, that they was uh, real easy to to get around uh, a town to wherever you had to go, just on, on pretty much on my bicycle. Tell them what you did when the tornado siren went off, Fred. Yeah, they, as Bill mentioned, we, were in, uh, we lived. The students lived in uh, school housing that had been converted Navy uh, barracks into apartments. And there was uh, alarms on the uh, buildings, uh, like fire alarms, except there were alarms also for a threat of tornadoes. And when that alarm went off, uh, you collected uh, your family and went to uh, a warehouse uh, that was still there from the Navy days. And they had a, an arrangement to uh, go down a short uh, ladder into a area underground that the floor was covered with loose gravel and it was actually a pump, pump in there, I guess battery powered. It could be used if the water got, came in, started coming in, it got deep. But if you can imagine, this was uh, students uh, mostly with uh, young families. So <laughs> you would find yourself in uh, that area underground sitting on benches uh, with a number of uh, small children now having to try to stop them from throwing gravel around <laughs> at people. So it was uh, a little wild uh, there, there, while waiting through uh, for the all clear uh, during some of those. And that, you know, this could be any time of day or it seemed like often it was in the nighttime when normally you'd want, uh, want to be in bed. Sure, yeah. Well, um, when you were at uh, OU, I was telling them that you uh, you were at the Notre Dame game that they broke our winning streak, but you got to see a lot with Bud Wilkinson. What uh, what are your memories about that? Well, it, you know, I had uh, those, those three years I had at OU uh, were all winning games uh, except for the game you mentioned, uh, the Notre Dame game, which ended the uh, win streak. That still is there today by uh, by long margin uh, for any college. Uh, uh, the high level college uh, class one uh, zone level one teams. And uh, there's, there's always was a, a saying that that day it was a pretty clear day and the score was nothing and nothing. And when Notre Dame started a march in the fourth quarter, uh, mostly running, but uh, very, very hard tackling, you could hear the pad hits up in the stands that day. Uh, this ominous looking uh, black cloud layer started coming in from the west. And by the time they had got down and scored, they over, an overcast had come overhead and dark darkened the uh, stadium. So there was a lot of uh, hearsay, uh, folktale, that the, uh, the Almighty had something to do with that to help Notre Dame win that game. Uh, the spirit of Newt, Ro Newt Rockney or something like that. Uh, that had uh, caused Notre Dame to win that game by one touch, the one touchdown, the only one scored that day. Fred, when you were at Van when you were at Grumman as a as a uh, vice president, what did you work on in Oklahoma? Oh, 
uh, well, one was Grumman. Uh, what uh, when Grumman and Northrop merged, I inherited Nawasi, a War Northrop Worldwide Aircraft Services Inc., a, a service company similar to the one I had formed for Grumman, and uh, they had a contract at Vance Air Force Base at the time uh, for all the uh, flight line maintenance, uh, aircraft maintenance, and also base support, uh, keeping up the roads and uh, uh, base housing and uh, pretty much everything on the base, except the Air Force had the uh, headquarters, of course, and they had the medical uh, facility, and they had the pilots. The pilots had uh, trained, trained the uh, students, and uh, also you were the simulator instructors. And the second contract uh, that was also in Oklahoma that was under Nawasi I inherited was the uh, uh, postal uh, training facility that's at Norman. We had that facility uh, under contract to do the operations and maintenance. I, one thing I was going to mention, uh, I was talking about the movie earlier, and uh, I was telling them that you talked to Ron Howard uh, about some of the some of the problems you saw in the film. You want to kind of wrap that, tell that for us, uh, uh, what, what you saw about the film, what you talked to Ron Howard about, and what he said. He greatly exaggerated my space sickness. I did suffer space sickness when I first got uh, into orbit. Uh, I was, I was uh, coached by uh, of those that have flown before to move very slowly uh, at first for several hours or even a half a day uh, to avoid getting space sickness. And unfortunately, my primary role uh, in the time we got on orbit was to get things from storage. And unfortunately, the cabinets where things were was underneath the couches uh, to get film, uh, to get cameras, to get brackets to put in the windows to hook up the cameras, uh, get the TV camera and its cables out uh, hook, to hook it up. And uh, in her, I was hurrying to do that, uh, having to turn, wrap, uh, ro roll and turn to get under the couch where that stuff was to buy more free time to look out the window, which was obviously a spectacular view. And uh, as a result of that the rapid moving around and turning, that, that caused me to onset a spit up. Uh, but the nice thing about space sickness is when that happened, I had a, a little bag in my pocket. I, captured it in and didn't make a mess like in the movie and uh stop moving if you if you slow down and, and that in that my case just stop moving for a little bit it went away and thereafter i moved very slowly and it never came back uh he also had a crew argument in the uh the movie jack swigert and and i having a fuss i accused jack of throwing the switch that caused the electric short you know if we had not been involved in a TV show, I would have normally been in that position and I would have thrown the switch, not Jack. There's no way of knowing that short was gonna happen. Uh, the other thing with Jim Lovell hugging me at a point in the movie. And uh, he of course also exaggerated grossly the manual maneuvers we did without the use of a computer with the earth going up and down in the window like we're gonna go out of control. Ron's uh, reasoning for doing those things in the movie was uh, explained to me, at least. He said, I, I got all the air to ground, all the radio transmissions for the whole mission and listened to them. And it appeared to me uh, from listening to that, you never had a problem. So he said, I had to add in some of that stuff to, uh, as, as he explained it, to humanize you. And so that's where that some of that drama was uh, put in the movie. But other than that, the movie the movie was accurate. The movie is probably one of the best space movies ever made. Okay, any questions? The book is Never Panic Early. Right. So I'm wondering when you looked outside the the spacecraft and saw the service module with the side blown off. Was there any sense of panic then? No, because when, when we when we first got to look at the service module, it was just a couple of hours before entry. So we had already gone through uh, working around all the things we had to to get to that point, approaching entry. 
So we, we had no idea that the damage was that extensive till then. Uh, and I, I would say there never was uh, on a, the flight, particularly a, uh, a never panic early, except in a period right after the explosion, when we got to the point of troubleshooting, that we'd run out of ideas to stop the leak, a very slow leak, in the second oxygen tank. Uh, we lost, and it was obvious uh, almost immediately at looking at the instrument panel, and of course, people on the ground with their readings and mission control, that we had lost oxygen tank two. It was gone. And uh, we thought we had tank one intact, but sl a slow leak showed up, and the, the people in mission control picked it up quicker. But uh, we fought uh, trying to save that tank by switching and uh, closing off valves here and there, uh, even reactant valves, uh, thinking the leak maybe through one of the fuel cells. And uh, it got to the point, obviously, we'd run out of ideas collectively. And Jim and I were asked to go hurry up and power up the limb. So that was a little never panic early time right in that phase. Uh, but not that we didn't do what we had to do to execute the limb power up, leaving uh, poor Jack Schweigert all alone. He was left with the task of ultimately powering down the mothership, the command module. If you could go to Mars, would you go? Uh, I would not. Uh, you have to realize that my background and uh, experience and what I love to do is fly airplanes. I was a test pilot for NASA for seven and a half years. And it's not going to be much piloting on a mission to Mars. Uh, it's a long, long trip. Uh, unless we, you know, we get better propulsion. Uh, you know, the non trips I've read about at least appear to be about eight months, uh, seven or eight months, one way to get to Mars. Uh, then probably with the automation we have and the computing power today, as you've seen with SpaceX and its Dragon capsule, uh, nobody flies it. I mean, they ride it and are ready to do an abort, but there's no uh, control stick in there and rudder pedals, if you will, like an airplane. So you, you don't fly anything anymore. You just ride along and monitor things and are ready to conduct an abort if you have to, which incidentally is all done through the computer. So there's no manual uh, today uh, involved. There's no piloting involved in doing an abort. So I'd say you probably get to Mars and they won't even let you, let you land a vehicle. It will be done automatically. So the mission doesn't appeal to me. I'm not a scientist. Uh, obviously, it would be something uh, they would, a scientist would look forward to, a geologist, uh, to get to, to Mars and land. Uh, but as a test pilot uh, who likes to fly things and operate things, uh, that would not be a very, very appealing mission. Well, thanks, Fred, for your time. We appreciate it, and uh, thanks for calling in. So you, you kind of got a flavor of working with Fred, and, and if you read his book, um, I think it'll really come alive for you. He had some historical connections, like uh, his grandfather was, was a student in, in Illinois, and his class got to read a poem at Abraham Lincoln's funeral. So that's, that's, that timeline is, is fascinating. Um, while Fred was at OU, uh, the great wrestler Danny Hodge was there. And he has some stories about Danny Hodge that were interesting, as well as um, Fred also served in the Oklahoma Air National Guard and flew their jet, the P-80, and he had a commander there named uh, Stanley Newman. And Fred was here working on his engineering degree because he wanted to be a test pilot. And he knew you needed an engineering degree to be a test pilot. So the, uh, this commander, Stanley Newman, suggested that Fred look at maybe when he gets his degree, applying at NASA and being a research pilot for them. And so Fred looked into it and he thought that was a great idea. He, uh, he then applied for the astronaut corps. Um, he had flown Chuck Yeager on a uh, chase flight, and I guess Yeager was impressed with him that Yeager invited him to, uh, to the, the same training that the astronauts get. 
Fred was uh, quite a pilot, and is. I mean, I, he, he doesn't fly today, but he's, he's, he's quite accomplished. Um, uh, as an astronaut, um, Fred was assigned to the Apollo 9 support crew. And part of that was to, um, to help Jim McDivitt, who was the commander, with he, his mission was to fly the first lunar module. And that was going to be in orbit around Earth. It wasn't to the moon. And um, he asked what he wanted him to do. And Jim McDivitt said, I want you and Ed Mitchell, who was also part of that support group, to go to Grumman and make sure they build me a good lunar module. So Fred spent, I know it was, I believe it was nine months in, in Long Island at Grumman while they worked on that lunar module. And what's amazing about all of this is, you think about the mission of Apollo 13, who did you need up there that knew the lunar module inside and out? And there was Fred Hayes. Um, it, it, it was just meant to be as one of those things. He knew that, he knew that spacecraft inside and out. So Fred was back up on Apollo 8 and Apollo 11. And that is significant in that Apollo 8 was the first to leave Earth. That's the one that orbited the moon and um, had a Christmas Eve message for Earth showing the lunar surface and reading from the opening of Genesis. And it was, a, it was, it was an amazing moment. Fred had a, had a uh, plane go down on him uh, in flight near Galveston. And he was trapped and it, he had severe burns on his body. And he fought through that, uh, rehabbed through that, and returned to flight status and then uh, flew command as commander of the shuttle Enterprise on the drop test. The they call it the alt test, and that was the first uh, method of testing the shuttle to see if it would actually glide. So <sighs> here again, you're asking these guys to hey go out and fly that thing, see if it'll land. But it went fine, and uh, shuttle program went on. Fred was scheduled to fly one of the early shuttle missions. In fact, they were there. We had a station called Skylab, and Skylab had been in orbit for a while after the last crew had left it. And um, his mission was they were going to take up a some kind of a motor and attach it to, sh to Skylab and take it to a higher altitude. But sh they kept getting delays in the shuttle being ready, and so it eventually re-entered the Earth's atmosphere and, and we lost Skylab. But um, when that occurred, Fred, and more delays, Fred decided to, to leave and he went into private industry. He was an executive with Grumman for, was it, it's like close to 30 years, and helped with a lot of the shuttle, space station, just everything that happened came under him as far as working to contract with NASA to do a lot of that. When he retired, he had thought about just fishing, but uh, um, right off the bat, he was approached by some local businessmen in, in Mississippi. They wanted to do a museum called Infinity. And so they asked Fred to support, and he's been supporting it ever since. And it's a really nice, really nice facility. Um, I've really enjoyed the book signings with Fred. Um, people come from all over, just love the guy. And he's, he's, uh, he, he's, he's pretty special. Thank you for watching our author talk featuring Bill Moore. For more author talks, visit Pioneer Library System's YouTube page.